Hey everyone, in this video we'll cover arrays in BigQuery. An array in BigQuery is a list where all the values have the same type of data. And arrays are a more complicated data type that complements existing ones you're familiar with, such as integers, strings, and timestamps. So in this example, we have a string field name, an int field age, and now we have an array field siblings. And you can see we can stuff multiple values into a single column, which is really neat. In the BigQuery UI, array fields are also known as repeated fields. So you'll see repeated next to the base type string in this UI. So what's the reason for using arrays? The number one reason is that in BigQuery, denormalized data is better. So you're, you might be used to a relational schema where every single entity is in a separate table. Trips in one, bikes in another, users in a third table. Well, if your data is big enough, your trips table might span multiple data centers. So will bikes and users. If you have to join between these data sources for every query you want to answer, that's gonna waste a lot of time. And so in BigQuery, uh, what we normally do is we publish read-only data sets that pre-join a lot of this information together so that if you're a business analyst trying to answer many questions, um, you don't need to perform this join over and over again. And so that's why uh, denormalized is better, and you'll soon realize that um, arrays provide a very convenient way to store uh, multiple pieces of information. So the second reason to use arrays is to avoid dealing with multiple columns or rows. Say, for example, you have a data set of patients when they clock into your practice and the symptoms they report for every visit. Well, if you choose to represent each symptom they report as a column, then you'll have a lot of columns that you need to hard code into your SQL queries. And many of these columns may have null values uh, because some patients just won't report any symptoms. Your SQL queries will have to deal with all these issues. Now let's suppose instead you have one row uh, per symptom that's reported. Well, now you have a lot of redundant information in your data set. You're gonna have Alex clocking in uh, at 8, clocking out at 8.41, repeated many times, one per symptom. So neither of these representations are ideal compared to the representation where you have a single visit per row, Alex clocking in at 8, clocking out at 8.41, and then a possible list of symptoms. And so how do we go about creating arrays? Well, the simplest option is to use brackets, just like any other programming language. The second option is to use built-in functions like generate array. So generate array works similarly to Python's range. You can specify a start point and end point and get an array of all the numbers in between. A third option is to use the array function with a subquery. So this is the array function. The subquery is any sort of table you can define. I just have a simple one here that unions all one and two. So this is what that table looks like. An array converts this t single column table into an array value. Now this query can be as complex as you want. You can add where's, you can add joins. It's up to you, but um, the output can only have one column. The fourth option, probably the most natural one, is to aggregate with the array ag function. So you may be familiar with other aggregation functions like sum, and count where you group by and array ag doesn't work any differently. So let's say we have this table from the example with hello six, hello three, world seven, world eight. Uh, we split this by groups um, by name. So then uh, H is one possible name, W is another, we have the values. And rather than summing or counting, we just group them together in an array with array ag. So what's neat about ArrayAg is you can use the distinct keyword, ignore nulls, order by, and limit to control how you want to form your array in your aggregation. In this example, we use order by val, so uh, the output will have the values in sorted order already. You can use limit, for example, to say, oh, I just want the first 10 values or so. So uh, there's a lot you can do uh, with ArrayAg. 
One additional thing you can take advantage of is to define your elements as structs. So you're not limited to one value per element.、Uh, if you use syntax like struct paren name and age,、uh, now you can store multiple values per element, which is really powerful. And in fact, you can even store arrays and structs. I'll have a future video where I go over how you work with structs in BigQuery. So now that you have an array, how do you access individual elements? Well, you would use square brackets with either the offset or ordinal built-in function.、Um, offset is zero indexed, ordinal is one indexed. So, for instance, if I have an array one, two, three, square bracket offset zero will get me the first element one. By the way, ordinal zero returns an error because、um, ordinal zero does not make sense by definition. Now. If you use offset, if the array index is out of bounds, offset returns null. So actually, if you say offset five of this array one two three, you're going to get a null value and no error. Your query will run as normal. If you want BigQuery to interrupt whenever an error occurs, you use the safe offset built-in function. And so safe offset will give you an actual error and stop execution. Um, if you have an out of bounds、uh, index. All right, so that's accessing one value with an index you know about already. What if you want to access multiple values? This is where the unnest function comes in. Unnest converts it basically into a table. So now you can operate on the rows like you would with、uh, any other SQL expression. And then we saw the array function earlier. Array Can pretty much work the opposite way. You get a one-column table, you convert it back to an array. So there's that relationship between a nest and array. So if I want one, two, three, and its squares, I just a nest one, two, three. But in、uh, the select clause, I want n and n times n. And so that's how you can work with a nest. Okay. Now when you a nest. The resulting rows may not be in order, which is not what you <laughs> would expect, but it helps BigQuery be more performant. So, if you want an order, you need to specify with offset. In this example, we have this array here. If we unnest with offset p, notice how the elements might be out of order、uh, in the rows, but at least we have the index, so we know the original order that the array was in. And then you can use where after you offset, just like with any other SQL expression. Now, when you say with offset, you provide a variable, so you can reference that variable name as well. So, if I say where p is greater than two, I'm just picking all the elements beyond position two, and so that gives me 400 and 500. So you can use this technique to slice arrays. Now here is the most common pattern you'll encounter when dealing with arrays. So at some point, you'll have a very complex denormalized schema. What if, for instance, you want to combine every array element with a broader piece of data? So the example here is we have foods、uh, split by category. So fruit, we have apple, banana, cherry, cheese, brie, cheddar, Swiss, and so forth. Um, what if I want fruit and apple, fruit and banana, fruit and cherry? Well,、uh, this is where the cross join pattern comes in. So you say from your original data set, cross join, and here you would unnest a subfield from your original data set, and now you'll be able to pair the broader piece of data with the more specific piece of data. Once we do the cross join a nest, we'll have the original data set as before, but now we'll have each individual array element next to that broader piece of data. From there, you can use where, group by,、uh, whichever other keywords you're interested in. This pattern is so common that there's a very simple syntax you can use instead. You can just use a comma to get rid of this cross join a nest part. So you can say select category item from foods comma foods dot item to get that pair of the broader data and the more specific data. 
Okay, so what other operations can you do with arrays? You can get the length of an array. You can check if some subquery has at least one value. And for this subquery, you can say from a nest of an array. And in works very similarly. So you can use a nest after in. So you would normally be used to saying in a hard-coded list of values, but this can actually be an array. Finally, uh, there's array to string, which joins arrays into a string. Um, for instance, if you have an array of a, b, c, and a delimiter, you can create a string out of that. And a typical use case is constructing URLs. Array concat will combine multiple arrays into one. Should be pretty straightforward. But there's actually also an array concat ag function, which you can use during aggregation. So let's walk through this example. This data set, hello one, two, world three, hello four, world five, six. Let's say we group by the name and then array concat these ags. So we're gonna split the array values by name. So now we have two rows, one, two, and four for group H. Array concat ag then uh, combines all of these arrays into one. So you would use array concat ag with what was before an array field and then you get one array as the output. All right, so that is everything you need to know roughly about arrays. Let's dive through an example data set. Let's head over to console.cloud.google.com slash bigquery. This is the bigquery UI. You can see that bigquery provides some public data sets to play with. For our example, we're going to look at Austin Bike Share. So there are two tables, bike share stations and trips. Let's focus on bike share trips. So in this table, we have one row per trip. Uh, there's a trip ID. Uh, there's a bike ID that served the trip. And then we have uh, information about the trip, when it started, where it started, where it ended, and how long the trip was. So as we're working with arrays, one natural thing we may want to do is group an output data set by bike. So for each bike, we'll have a list of trips. I have the query prepared beforehand, so let's walk through what that query looks like. So we can define a new table trips per bike, such that once we have this new table, we don't need to group by bike ID for every query it will already be um, set up that way in the output. So we'll say select bike ID, and then for each trip, we want actually a struct of the start time, the start station, end station, and how long it took. So this will be one bundle per trip, and then we'll have a list of trips for each bike. So from this BigQuery public data set, you can go into more, click on query settings, and then you can write this query into an output. So rather than saving this in a temporary table, we'll select a destination. Uh, you can create a new data set. I'll just call this uh, arrays YouTube, and then, um, oh, it needs to be underscore sure, arrays YouTube. Um, and once we create that data set, we can name this trips per bike. And now I have a new data set that is based on arrays. So let me run this query. So it doesn't take too long to run because this data set is pretty small. Uh, now that the results are here, and you can see each bike has a list of trips, uh, each with its start time, duration, and the stations. Cool. And so now we can refer to this new data set. Uh, if I just refresh my project here, maybe I need to refresh the page. So once we refresh the page, we'll see our new Arrays YouTube data set, trips per bike. Uh, the two fields are the bike ID and a list of trips, a repeated record.
So going back to our Jamboard, what is going on visually? Well, from the original trips table, we're grouping by bike ID, such that there is one trip per row for each bike, and then we aggregate uh, each individual trip into uh, an array. So here are some example queries we can issue. The first example is, let's say I want to choose 10 bikes that have at least one 20 minute trip. So how you would do this is you would um, check to see which bikes have a trip. So you use exists and then you would unnest the list of trips to find a trip with a duration greater than 20 minutes. Then a second question you can ask is for each month, how many new bikes were introduced? So we sorted the trips based on when the first trip was taken, right? We ordered by start time. And so you can use offset zero to locate the very first trip that the bike has performed. Let's format it so that rather than having a very specific date, we just have the year and the month. And then we count based on this year month uh, piece of data. And then maybe a third question you're interested in is when were the most recent trips in this data set? To get to know this data set better, you can just unnest all the trips from the bikes and then sort by uh, trip start time, just to get an idea. And so with those questions, uh, let's tackle a more difficult question. Let's say I'm running this bike sharing service and I want to know if newer bikes get more usage than older bikes. So a way we can formulate this question is we can ask, what is the average amount of time per bike over September 2021 based on the month introduced for the bike? So I got September 2021 from the most recent trips in this data set. And then we're going to reuse the month introduced part from the last slide uh, in this query. And so you can use the with clause to break up your query into multiple parts. So let's just get all the trips first that were from after the start of September. So we need the bike ID to compute the average per bike. We're going to get the month introduced. We're going to get the minutes uh, from bike unnested with trips because we want to associate each trip with its bike. And so that's where the cross join comes in. Now that we have this uh, intermediate table, we can then select the month introduced, which will be our group. We're going to sum all the minutes divided by the number of distinct bikes in that group. So this is your average from this intermediate table grouped by the month introduced as before. And what you'll see is that, hey, people love to ride on new bikes. By far, there's more usage on bikes per, on average uh, introduced just in the previous month. Visually, uh, the bike will look newer. And then you'll see, uh, there are some bikes that have uh, uh, been introduced just a few months before. There's a interesting batch <laughs> from 2020 that made it to the top three, but there could be an outlier, so on and so forth. So this is just a fun example of a more complex query you can do with the intermediate data set that we produced. So with that, thank you so much for tuning into this video. I'll see you in the next one.